Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents with God's Church of Love Online, and we're reading Luke chapter 5. You know, let me say this real quick. Sometimes, you know, God wants things out of our lives because he wants to use us. And some of us are too fat. We're too fat with weights and sins that so easily beset us. We're too fat with fears and anxieties. We're too fat with the worries of the world. We're too fat with all kinds of stuff, attitudes and anger issues and friction with brothers and sisters in Christ and those that are out of Christ, whatever. But there are issues in our lives that sometimes we don't address. And there are things God wants us to do. He wants us to see. He wants to show himself in our lives the way that he wants us to see him. He wants us to get his love, to get the kind of God he really is, to, to understand his heart. And he wants us to recalibrate our lives according to what he shows us, what he teaches us, how he deals with us, purges, purifies us. So I'm going to read this real quick, and then we'll get into the message. Amen? Amen. All right. So now we are reading Luke chapter 5. We're starting from verse 1 to 10. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of, Gen uh, of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered in one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed unto him that he should thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. And Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. <sighs> Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, when I read that verse five, it sounds like Peter was, was tuckered out. He was tired. He was too pooped to pop. He was not thinking about starting another level of work all over when he had already exhausted his day and was exhausted as a result. You could hear the exhaustion in that sentence. But the nevertheless was his level of obedience. Now check this out. <laughs> Verse 6. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they would come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, mm, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished at all that were with him and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. So was the James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Verse 11, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. You know, that's one of the hardest things for us to do is forsake all and follow him because the cares of this world weigh us down. The cares of this world put so much pressure on us. The whole system out there, the media, the, the whole financial system, everything is set up to weigh us down. That's what the Bible means when it says the devil he, he aims to wear out the saints. We're so busy being worn out, we can't get about our father's business. But thank God for the disciples. They had enough sense to forsake all and follow him. It was like a nevertheless obedience. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net once again. I'm tired 
I don't feel like being bothered. My stomach is growling. I want to eat. My bed is calling me. I'm exhausted. I want to dive under the bed. I don't want to be asked to do another thing today. But at thy word, I will do what you ask. And sometimes it's in the obedience that goes diametrically opposed to our flesh. That that is when we see the miracle of God. That is when we see God's manifestation in our lives. Is when we go against what we feel, what we see, what we understand, what our bodies are crying out for. When we go against me, myself, and I, when we go against following our own understanding and following his word in spite of how we feel and what we see, in spite of what we know <laughs> and what has occurred during that day. When we follow God in spite, that's when the miracles begin. That's, we won't see the miracles. If Peter had excused himself, man, I'm tired. I've been doing this all day. We're, we're done. We're going home. We ain't, we're not putting in another minute. My shift is over. I'm done. And God was calling him to do another shift, but he was doing it for another reason. This was supernatural. This was not for him to stay to remain a fisherman. This was for him to be about his father's business. Now, one of the things that's hard for us as human beings is that we live in a system that requires so much of us. It really does squeeze God out. And it's not until you determine that if I lose my house, if I lose my car, if I lose my friends, if I lose all my social connections, if I lose my money, if I lose my reputation, whatever it is you may lose, it's when you're willing to lose it all that God steps in and shows you who he really is. Think about that. It was only when, when Peter had the nevertheless obedience. That was the only time. And that was the only way he was going to see the miracle. Now, think about it. Think about the logic. The logic now. There are times, as much as I love God, as, as miraculous as he has been in my life, I have honestly told him, some of the things you say just don't make sense. But then I have the pea brain, and he knows it all. So knowing that he knows, I have to trust him when he says, do this or do that. Now, imagine now you're in a boat. Picture this. I'm trying to paint a picture so you can understand how sometimes the most in the most nonsensical things God says. In other words, it doesn't make sense to our pea brains. And when we activate our faith, it's the only way we're going to see what he was trying to do. But when we lean to our own understanding, we limit and we tie God's hands inadvertently because he can only be activated by what? F-A-I-T-H. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Oh, if we could just get that. Some of the miracles don't happen in your lives because you don't have faith. Because you're leaning to your own understanding. All right. So imagine this now. You're in the boat. You're in the boat. The water you're sitting on is the same water, the same body of water. 
launching a net on the left side, on the front side, on the back side, or the right side of the boat, honestly, in the natural, is not going to make any difference, is it? I'm, I'm milking this. I want you to really, I want you to really suck all the bone and marrow out of this. It doesn't make sense. We just worked all day. We had our nets out all day. We didn't even bring up an old, an old piece of junk from the bottom of the sea. We didn't bring up a thing, not even seaweed. And you're going to tell me, think about it now. You're going to tell me, I don't even know you. You're going to tell me to launch, to launch out and let my net out on the other side of the boat. Why? We've been doing this all day. We do this for a living. This is our specialty. I know what I'm doing. But what happened? In spite of what I know, in spite of what makes sense, okay, I'll put my net out. I don't believe this man telling me to do this. It don't even make sense. And it's when you do the things that God tells you to do that doesn't make sense. That's when the miracles begin. They are ignited. They are sparked. <laughs> the power switch is flipped on. And the games begin in the miracle working realm. Your miracles are in the nevertheless realm of faith. Oh, think about that. The nevertheless realm of faith is where your miracles lie. They're hiding under the cloak of nevertheless faith. And until you remove the covering of your own understanding and push your own understanding to the side and forsake all that makes sense to you, you will never see the miracles until you are willing to take that step of faith, to make that leap, to, to do whatever it takes to obey God in spite of your own understanding. And it wasn't until Peter obeyed that the calling of God was upon his life. Think about that. Once he obeyed and he saw the miracle, godly sorrow hit his heart. He repented and bam, the games began. From now on, you shall be catchers of men. That's the call. Some of you haven't gotten your assignments in the kingdom because you won't step out on faith. You got too strong a grip on the world. You know that. You know that, Turf. You do this for a living, like Peter. That was his specialty. You ain't going to tell me that on the left side or the right side, the front or the back of the boat, the water is going to be different. Where there were no fish, there ain't going to be no fish no matter where we put that net. We've been here all day long, baby cakes. And some of you have been there too long. But you won't step out on faith. The miracle's waiting for you but you won't. All right. Now, another thing that holds us back from seeing the miracles of God, we got the cloak that covers the cloak of our own understanding, covering up and blocking the realm of miracles that comes from faith, right? And obedience, obedient faith. Now, or obedience through faith. The other thing that blocks it is strife. Mm, let's go to that. James chapter four. Okay, James chapter four, 
says this, starting at verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of this world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Wow. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Here's another thing. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if the judge, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Wow. Now listen, listen, listen. I stopped at verse 12. See, that's another area that weighs us down, that that adds to that cloak that blocks us from the, the, the realm of the miraculous. Our attitudes, our tempers, our words, hmm, the friction, the fights, the wars, the, the combativeness going back and forth, the, 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 the petty arguments, the petty little offenses. See, some of you have petty offenses and petty arguments because you need to be healed. You're living your life scarred and bruised and you won't go to the healer to heal that crap. Cause I'm telling you, once that stuff is healed, People, things, words won't spark you, won't get on your last nerve because you won't have that many nerves to get on because most of your nerves will be healed. You'll be a much easier person to get along with and it will be much easier for you to get along with others with their shortcomings as well. That's what healing brings about. It makes life easy. But when you're not healed and you're scarred up, and you're flinching and you're jumping and you're reacting and you're, and you've got these rash, uh, uh, impulses and you're, and you're, you 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 got these flare ups of temper and your, your mouth flies open and you and then you gotta ask God to forgive you for what you just said. Whether you said it to them or behind their back about them. That is the weight that so easily besets us and it weighs us down. And it adds to the crust of that cloaking that blocks us from the realm of the miraculous. Now let's go to the next one that blocks the realm and then we'll be done. Let's go to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? 
And who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Now let's stop there for a second just to explain what that means. Refiner's fire. Fire is used to purify. Think of gold. That is the way you get the most pure form of gold is by purifying it with fire. That's how you get that. The longer you purify it in fire, the purer the gold. Fuller soap was a soap they used back in the day. It did a lot of cleaning. It's like dawn nowadays with dishwashing liquid and you've got a lot of oil, soot, and grease from the food and you need a strong detergent that breaks up that oil, that breaks up that grease. Well, that is what we're dealing with. And the grease comes from fat. Fat comes from sin. I'm being allegorical now. Verse three, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. That speaks for itself. Four, then shall the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. Let me add this little tidbit. This is an aside right here. What I want to say to you is if you do not understand what I have read in scripture at any given time on any video, Comment in the comment section and ask me what that means. And I will do my best to explain it because we all need to understand scripture. The Holy Spirit helps me a lot with that. Okay, so now let's move on. Mm, mm, mm. Verse five, and I will come near to you to judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. Do you hear that? So some of you call yourself Christian witches, listen to this, and I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against, not for, against the sorcerers and against the adulterers. For those of you who got a little side lover hanging in the back in the corner in the dark, and against False swearers, for those of you who lie or you swear and then you go against your word and you renege, renege, renege over and over and over again. And against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, those of you who hold back what you know could really help people have a living because you want to have more, 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 and you don't care about what happens to them. You just want to use them to advance your interests. And then it says the widow and the fatherless, those of you who know you can help widows out, who know you can help the fatherless, and you turn aside the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Mm, mm, mm. Let's see if I'm going to go any further. Let me know, Lord. Okay, so I'm going to say right here that that is another thing that hinders us. That's another thing right there is that we are so busy building our own kingdoms, our own palaces, our own castles that we don't have time. We want to have what's beautiful, but we don't want the widow over there to have anything that's pretty. We don't want that father, that fatherless adult that's lived an orphan life, that's been from, from um, home to home, foster care to foster care, that's been abused, that's going through changes, that really needs to get a grasp, a grip on life and a grip on the Lord. But you don't have time because you're too busy building your kingdom. You already got way more than enough. But you don't want to take the time to deal with them because you don't want to be bothered with other people's needs. You want to go have fun. 
but you don't want to help them pay their light bill or help them stay in their apartment. You want to have fun, but you don't want to help them fix their plumbing because you are too busy building your palace and buying Gucci pocketbooks and 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 fifteen hundred dollar suits and uh twenty five thousand or twenty five hundred dollar watches. Whatever your reason is, you don't have time for those in need. You, you, you just don't. If they're eating and they got a roof over their head to you, that's, that ought to be good enough for them. All right. Now, that's what they're saying. All right. Now we're going to go a little further. Now this, wow. Will a man rob God? Verse 8. Yet ye have robbed me, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Now, I'm going to stop there because the curse with a curse really pertains to Old Testament. So we're not putting that on you. What I'm dealing with is there are things that limit us from the miraculous. You see what I mean? So many of you, you will give to T.D. Jakes or or Benny Hinn or some of these big ministries where thousands and millions of people are already given. But you won't support somebody on YouTube, a little ministry. Some of you on YouTube, some of my, you know, some of my friends that I've known since uh, 1981, when I got saved. I have a friend right now who tells me all the little ministries she gives to. In all these years, she's never given to mine because I don't have a building. But even when I did have a building. She never did. So what I'm trying to say is some of you are, your focus is in the wrong place. You want to you wanna throw all your change over there. Why? Because they can give you that 501c3 tax write-off. So it's not that you're giving and trusting God. It's that you're giving, making sure you give to the right pot because you want to get something back. But there are people out there, there's a lady I know on YouTube right now. There's a lady out there, she gives, she has organizations, she's, she's way beyond me and what she does. But she's still considered a small ministry. And I bet you, I bet you my bottom dollar. Um, no, I don't bet, I don't gamble, just saying it as an expression. That there are people out there that will bypass her to give to a big church where you already got 500, 5,000, 25,000, 250,000 people giving to that pot. That pastor's living fat off the hog. While this woman on YouTube, she might be still struggling to pay her bills because she's small, she doesn't have a building, but she's got a beautiful establishment that blesses other people's lives. But because she's small, nobody gives to her. So she's struggling, but she's probably putting out way more time than the pastor with 250 to 2,500 members because they got a staff and they all get paid. But how dare she expect to get paid? I mean, that's all she wants is money. Baby, she ain't got the money. So you know, there are people out there, there are men out there that spend all day doing editing and all kind of work on their videos. And you guys on YouTube watch it, benefit from it, but you don't sow into their ministry. So what if they don't have a building? Whether you give to me or whether you give to somebody else, think about the small ones. The ones that are out there, the widowers, the widows, the, the single parents, the people that are out there hustling. They're trying to get ads on their YouTube so they can get a few, a few dollars every month. They're not doing it to get rich. They're doing it for ministry, but they got to do the ads because nobody sows into them. I don't do ads because I'm trusting God. I demonetize my channel. So some of you or you, you've got all these areas where, you know, like one lady told me straight out, she doesn't trust the ministry because I'm living off of this, 
blessings that I get. They're not a lot of blessings, but they're substantial for me. They make a big difference. They help me buy food because God told me to get off of food stamps. So that's what he's saying. You hold your fist tight and you hold back from those who are in need. And you limit them because you feel like they shouldn't get but so much while you have overabundance. You can splurge over here and splurge over there and travel over here and travel over there and buy this marble wall and this marble enclosed shower. And you can do all this beautiful stuff. But why should you buy something new and beautiful? No, you should, you know, use what you got and something beat up and beautify it. That's what you do. And th that's the way they think. Work with what you got and stay there. Stay in your place while I fly and soar in my prosperity. That's what God's talking about. I'm not talking about gifts and offerings right now. Because some of you ain't going to give to this ministry no matter what. And that's that. That's fine. You, you know, give wherever the Lord tells you to give. The bottom line is, if you're not giving at all to anybody, if you're not giving to the woman across the street who's got five kids, whose husband used to abuse her, he left her, and now she's struggling just to keep the roof over her kid's head because you have a brand new carpet you want to get. That carpet can wait. But her rent might not. That one month's rent might make the difference between them being on the streets or not. Because you have it within your means, but you refuse to do anything because you don't want her shining too much. You, 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 know, uh, you know, she's poor. Just let her stay poor. I'll help her out a little bit. But, you know, don't ask too much of me now. You got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so whether you send your money to a church or you help that lady down the street or you help that man who just lost his leg, who has served his country, your love should be to the least of these. Jesus said, when you've done it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. All right. That's tithe and offerings, tithes, Old Testament, offerings, New Testament, however you want to see it, it's the level of giving. That's what he's looking at. You see a need, you don't you shouldn't have to be asked. You see the need, you feel it. Let me share this with you real quick. Years ago, and then I'm gonna close. Years ago, when my husband and I were in the living room, his son called him. I'm just sharing this. I don't, I don't sound a trumpet about things that we give because this really wasn't from our pocket. It was from a loan and we were going to have to pay it off. And God worked the way we didn't even have to do that. Thank God. Through negative circumstances, believe it or not. But anyway, my husband's son called him and he was crying and he, his back was up against the wall. His wife and his kids, they didn't have anywhere where they were going to go. They were trying not to move into his mother's house because there was really no room. There was no room at our house. You know, they would have been able to come if they wanted to, but there was no room. They would have all been packed up in the living room. So the point is their back was up against the wall. Now, listen. Listen to this. Milton and I had a credit line. Now, we didn't have money, but we had a credit line. And I had access to 10, I think it was like 13, $13,000. That's what I had access to. And it was only 2% interest back then. So, you know, we were willing to bite the bullet, but that was all we had. Everything else, we were living from hand to mouth. We were struggling to keep our head above water. The reason I say that is because we also could not pay our mortgage. So what happened was 
We knew we had time, but this was a matter of being out on the street versus having a roof over your head. So when he called crying to his father about not having a place to stay, that they were going to be put out because they were going to revamp and turn those into condos that they couldn't afford to live in. So they were putting all the residents out. They didn't see it coming. It was like, bam, they only had 30 days and they had to bust a move and they didn't have a, a nickel or a dime. They just had enough to pay their bills, but not enough to move anywhere. So he was really, really in a desperate mode. Thank God he was a child of God as well. And he was asking his father for prayer. He wasn't asking for help because Milton was on a fixed income. He knew he couldn't do anything. So Milton prayed with him. And then he said, uh, I want you to talk to, 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 to Pat. I want her to pray for you, see if the Lord says anything. So he hands me the phone. And I'm on the phone with him and, and Milton said, tell Pat what's going on. So as he's telling me what's going on, I'm praying under my breath, Lord, you know, what do we do about it? <laughs> Listen to this. And as soon as my mind went there, the number one zero comma zero 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 came to my mind. Ten thousand not one thousand ten thousand we don't have that you got your credit line ah but lord that was for milton's hot tub we're gonna have a hot tub put in the backyard not now you're not this is a dire need that's a luxury but lord he's waited all these years ten thousand dollars I said, okay, Lord, I want to make sure this is you because I didn't want to let go of the money, be honest. I said, Lord, if you are really saying to do that, I'm asking you for a sign. All this is going on while his son is talking to me on the phone. Give me a sign. It's a mental prayer. Give me a sign. Make him say that amount out of his mouth. And we'll do it. So I said, can we call you right back? And he said, okay. I hung up. I told Milton what the Lord said. Milton said, what? I was only going to try to give him a thousand. I said, I know, but this is what God said. Cause we're thinking out of our own pocket. We weren't even thinking about the credit line. So <laughs> that's all, you know, Milton could have squeezed out between the two of us. It was a thousand. But the Lord took my mind to the credit line. So I told Milton, I said, that'll mean no hot tub. And he said, oh, Lord. He said, okay. He said, if the Lord says, do it, baby, let's do it. That's my son. So we, that's what we did. We prayed and we called him right back. And I said, okay, my, I said, I said, let me ask you. If you were to have that magic amount, that would solve all your problems, put a roof over your head, not have you out on the street, take care of everything. What amount would that be? And this is what he said. Well, it doesn't matter because I know you guys don't have it. I just want you to pray. I said, just tell me what amount would that be? Oh, well, and he went on and on about two or three times. Finally, I said, just tell me the amount. And he said, it'd be about $10,000 back. I said, okay, come by and pick it up tomorrow. I'll have a check for you. <laughs> as much as I didn't want to do it, as soon as I said that, I felt wonderful inside. I knew that was the will of God. And as a result, they never missed a beat. They were in another place in a New York minute. They were situated. Never since then, they haven't had that threat on their lives. What a blessing. Now, Milton had to do without a hot tub, but look how God works. That was a major sacrifice because that was Milton's dream above dreams. God blesses us with a house up here, right? We short sale the old house because we're in foreclosure, y'all. Two years of not paying a mortgage. We're in foreclosure. We get up here 
And guess what's waiting for Milton up here in his brand new home, in a senior gated house that he owns in his name, two story, two bedroom, two bath, 1400 square foot home for $68,000. Guess what's waiting for him up here? A hot tub, y'all. God made sure that he didn't miss out completely. He might have had a delay, but the delay was not a denial. And some of y'all need to take that one to the bank. Your delay is not your denial. Mm, mm, mm. And guess what I had waiting for me? A swimming pool and a pool table. Right there in the clubhouse of the senior gated community. <laughs> I'm telling you. God will never let you sacrifice and not reward you for it. That's why you have to trust God. You have to act on faith. You have to step out and remove that barrier. Remove that cloak and dagger thing. Remove that covering that blocks you from your miracles by stepping out on faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And we must line up with his script and his plan for our lives so that we can be in a position to serve the Lord and be about our father's business, casting our nets and catching men. Are you willing to do what it takes? Take that leap of faith so you can position yourself to be a servant of God for the rest of your life. I leave that with you. And that answer, that's between you and God. God bless you. I'm done. Walk in the miraculous, y'all. It's beautiful. I like this address. <laughs> All right, I'm done.